Well, I hope everyone had a good break. Um, we need to keep going, though. All right, we need to keep moving. Um, I, don't, I don't have the average for the test. I don't recall what it was. I, I, I believe after the curve, it is up above a 70. I want to say that the, before the curve, the average was like a 68. And after the curve, it was obviously seven more than that. Um, if you have any questions on the test, please just get with me as usual. We can go through it if you feel like you don't understand what went wrong or you think you deserve credit when I took off. Just, just come sit down with me. Um, we are going to pick up exactly where we left off. And I had forgotten where we le left off. So I went back and I watched my YouTube lecture at least the last 10 minutes from last time before the test. And we were doing Lagrange multipliers. So I don't know if you're going to be able to clear the cobwebs out of spring break, but uh, the last problem I did was a problem that I had offered as bonus that I believe one or two students turned in. And then I did that problem using Lagrange multipliers, and it was much easier. And so today, what I'm going to do is just remind you of what Lagrange multipliers method was. And then I'm going to do one more example. Um, and then I'm going to move on to the next section. All right? Actually, do one more example and then show you one more thing after that. So with, with the Lagrange method of Lagrange uh, multipliers, it gives us a way of finding the maximum and minimum values of a function of either two variables or three variables when that function is constrained to some equation. And this method actually extends out. You can go further than a function of three variables. You can go to a function of four variables, five variables. That's what makes it so powerful. And then, um, as you'll see at the end, you can have more than one constraint also. So where I'm going to pick up is when we have a function of three variables, how it is that we can find the maximum or minimum. So what we do is we take the gradient of the function we're trying to find the maximum and minimum of, and we set it equal to lambda, which is some constant, times the gradient of g, where g is the constraint equation solved. Like you get the constant on one side. I, can, I think I can go back one more slide and show you this. There we go. So if you have a, a function of three variables subject to a constraint, g of x, y, z is equal to a constant, then what you do is you find the x, the y, the z, and the lambda that make the gradients equal to each other, or parallel, so they're off by a, a constant. And you also have to satisfy the, the constraint equation. That's it. If you can find those values, that'll mm -hmm. tell you where the max and mins occur. So I thought the, the good example to start would be to do a word problem. And I'm going to do this one right here. So you have, the question is find the point or find the point or points on the sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4 that are closest and farthest from this point. So you have a, a, a sphere, right? And you have a point sitting out in space. Let me take those points out of there. So there's a sphere and there's a point. So, you know, Earth and a satellite, Earth and a meteor, whatever, d doesn't matter, right? Earth and something. You want to know where on Earth, what point on the surface of Earth is closest to this point and which one is maybe furthest away. So does it, does it make sense to you that the point closest is right here in the blue? The one furthest away would be on the other side, correct? In red? Okay, so we would like to find those two points, if possible. Somehow this is a Lagrange problem. So let's see if you can help me get it set up. What is your, what is your objective function? What is the function you're trying to find the maximum or minimum of? Is, is that it? Is this your F? Read the problem. Find the point or points on the sphere that are closest and farthest. So you're talking about two points in space, right? This one and some other point, right? 
And you want to know a distance between those, don't you? You want to know, want to know when that distance is the smallest and the largest. But see that this point's fixed, right? That point's fixed. The other point can't just be anywhere. Where does it have to be? On the sphere. So the sphere is the actual constraint of that other point. Understand that? So that's actually the constraint equation. The objective function, which is the one we're trying to find the maximum min of, we have to come up with, which would be the distance between two points. So what is the distance between two points? What is the distance between, let's say a point, let's call it x, y, z, oops, and that point right there, 3, 1, negative 1. So what is the distance formula? I always press the wrong button. Um, what is the distance formula for points in, in three-dimensional space? Uh, you could do a vector. You could, yes. Um, but then are, if you do that, you know, well, I guess we could. We could do that, yeah. You want to do that? If we find the length of it. If that's the first thing you're thinking, then I'm willing to go with that. I was going to go just straight to a distance formula, but if that makes I mean, most sense to you, look at it, that's the same thing. it's the same thing, exactly. So let's call it, let's call it um, D for now, the distance. Should be equal to the square root of, square root because it's a length, of the vector that connects these points together, right? So the vector that, let's say, connects this point to this point, wouldn't that be this coordinate minus this coordinate? squared plus uh, this coordinate minus this coordinate squared plus this coordinate minus this coordinate, which would be z plus 1 squared. Do you agree that, that that represents the distance between x, y, z and 3, 1, negative 1? Yes? Any questions on that? We want to know when that's the biggest it can be and when it's the smallest it can be. But we have to be able to live on that sphere, right? So I'm going to convert this d over to a function of three variables, because that's what it is, right? Distance relies on x, y, and z. So it is a function of three variables. Here it is. That's my objective function. What is the constraint equation? So constraint, the book uses a semicolon. To, when you're looking, doing your homework, they say, here's the objective function. And then they put the constraint next to it. So like this. OK, so that's our constraint. Then the left side of this is our g of x, y, z. Follow? Now what we need is to find an x, a y, a z, and a lambda that make this true and make the gradient of this a scalar multiple of the gradient of this. So how many equations am I actually going to have here? Four. four. It'll be four. three from the gradient, and then a fourth one is this one. So let's write down these four equations. The first equation is going to be the partial of f with respect to x must equal lambda partial of g with respect to x. I realize you had spring break, but I am expecting that you are picking up where you left off. Okay, if you have to go back and watch a little bit of the last lecture, go ahead. <laughs> That's where I'm picking up. It's as if we never left. Partial of f with respect to y equals lambda partial of g with respect to y is the second equation. The third equation is the partial of f with respect to z must be equal to lambda times the partial of g with respect to z. And then the fourth and final equation is going to be the constraint equation itself, which is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. Those are the four equations we have to satisfy. Any questions? We're good? OK, let's take the partial. Ooh. 
the partial of f with respect to x. Now that looks bad, but it's just chain rule, right? So we're going to treat y and z like they're constants. What is the derivative of the square root of something? 1 over 2 times the square root of that something, right? So I'm going to have to erase some stuff if I'm going to keep this all on camera. So uh, why don't I erase this? Don't think I'm going to need that right now. So I'm going to do equation 1. If you're doing it on your paper, just work it below. But equation 1 is now going to turn into, OK, this is, we said 1 over 2 square root of all that stuff, right? which I'm going to call junk times. I, I use junk that's, I'm paying tribute to my old professor. He used to always do that too. He used to always just write junk. And so I'm doing junk too. All right. Now, that's a derivative of the square root of something then times derivative of what's inside with respect to x. So these are gone, aren't they? Who cares about those? This, though, another little chain rule. Two pops out, right? Two times x minus 3 to the first power. First power, I don't need to write it, times the derivative of what's inside, which is just 1. So that's it. That's a derivative of f with respect to x. That must equal lambda times the derivative of g with respect to x. Now, here's g. What's the derivative of g with respect to x? to x. All right, that wasn't so bad, I guess. We OK with that? All right, now, second equation. Take derivative of this with respect to y. So I still get 1 over 2 root junk, right? Times, now go inside. Derivative of the inside with respect to y would be 2 times y minus 1. Is that correct? So, agree? Yes? yes? OK, you're looking like, yes? Equals, right? <coughs> Lambda times 2y. Third equation. 1 over 2 root junk times 2 times z plus 1 must equal lambda times 2z. And then the fourth equation, remember, is this one, right? Let's just not forget that's our fourth equation. All right. Any questions before I continue? No? OK, what, what I'm going to do, and this is where you're going to run into the issues when you're trying these on your own, is you know, how are you going to go about solving these, trying to figure out what x, y, z, and lambda are. I'm going to solve each of these for lambda. And then I can set them equal to each other, can't I? Do you agree with that? Um, so if I'm going to solve this equation for lambda, I'm going to have to divide by 2x. What do I have to promise you then? X can't be 0, right? If I, um, if I decide to solve this for lambda, I have to divide by 2y, which means I have to promise you that y can't be 0, right? And if I do the same here, I have to promise you that z can't be 0. So as long as I assure you that x, y, and z are all not 0, so I'm going to say that, suppose x, comma, y, comma, z, all of them are not 0. So x and y and z are all not 0. Then what does equation 1 turn into? By the way, these 2's canceled, didn't they? Those 2's canceled. Those 2's canceled. So what does this turn into if I solve it for lambda here? x, x over 3 on the left side over 2x in the square root of the junk, right? So I'm going to put 2x root. I'm even going to get shorter. I'm just going to root j instead of root junk, OK? That's lambda, isn't it? That's lambda. I'm not going to write lambda. What I'm going to write instead is, well, I'll write lambda, OK, fine. Let's go second equation. What does the second equation become? Same thing, divide through. You get y minus 1 over what? 
to y root j is lambda. And the next thing, third equation is z plus 1 over 2z root j equals lambda. Now, what am I allowed to do at this point? Set them equal to each other, right? So why don't I set, I'm still working here, why don't I set 1 equal to 2, OK? If I set 1 equal to, do, to 2, I get x minus 3 over 2x root junk must equal y minus 1 over 2y root junk. Now, I don't like the root junk. May I multiply both sides by root junk? Yes, right? How can you assure me that the root of the junk will never be 0? Because remember, you can never multiply both sides of an equation by 0. What does the root of the junk represent? Go back to where it came from. What does it represent? It's the distance between x, y, z, and that point, right? Can that distance ever be 0? Not if we're on the sphere, right? Unless that point lives on the sphere, but I don't think it does. So we're safe to multiply both sides by root junk here. And we can multiply by 2, couldn't we? So I, it's going to look a little nicer right now if I just go to this. Right? Now, can I multiply both sides by x? Is x ever going to be 0? Not right now, right? Not right now. So I can multiply both sides by x. I can also multiply both sides by y, can't I? All right, so let's do that. I'm going to continue working. I guess I'll, I'll just work right in here. OK, I'm continuing this. Multiply this side by y, you get xy minus 3y equals. Multiply both sides by x. x goes away here. You get xy minus x. You see how nice this is about to be? Subtract xy on both sides. And you get that, what, 3y is x? That's a relationship between x and y now, isn't it? Now, that was me just solving one of the, or setting just two of those equations equal to each other. What if I go and I set the first equation equal to the third equation now? I'm probably going to get another relationship, right? So you want to go ahead and do that? Any questions on this? See, all right, seeing some glazed looks, is that could just be spring break still? OK, what if I set equation 1 to 3 now? Then, yeah, it should get a relationship x and z. Let's see. That's, that's equation 1, right? That's this. Now, the third one I erased. But it was uh, z plus 1 over 2z root junk, wasn't it? Do the exact same thing we just did. Multiply both sides by root junk. Multiply both sides by 2. Both, multiply both sides by x. Multiply both sides by z. You should get xz minus 3z equals xz plus x. Y'all understand what I'm doing there? OK, xz's cancel. You get negative 3z equals x. Now I have a relationship between x and z, don't I? Let's get one more relationship. Well, maybe we don't even need it. Let's see. I don't think I need it, because what's my fourth equation? The constraint, right, which has x, y, and z in it. So I'm going to go ahead and write my constraint down right here, equation 4. With equation 4, I have x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. Now, I know if I, if I leave x alone, I know I can just say x squared. But what can I replace y with? So come back over here. Be careful here. I can solve this for y and replace it with 1 third x, right? Take that, plug that in here. Wouldn't you get 1 ninth x squared when you square it? Yeah? Then over here, I could solve this for z. z would be negative 1 third x, wouldn't it? Take that, plug that in here, square it, and you'd get another 1 ninth x squared, wouldn't you? 
Are we good or not? It's all right? These are all common or like terms, right? So how many ninths is that over there? Nine ninths plus one ninth. Nine ninths plus one ninth plus eleven ninths equals four. We agree? Multiply by the reciprocal. X squared should be 36 elevenths. And now take the square root, right? And when you take the square root, you have to do plus or minus. And you take the square root. So when I do that, I should get X is plus or minus the square root of 36 over the square root of 11, which I'll just leave as root 11. Right there, we've nailed down what X is. X is either positive 6 over root 11 or negative 6 over root 11. Now, how can I get Y? Remember what Y was? I just erased it. It was 1 third X, wasn't it? So multiply this by 1 third. What would happen if I multiply? Oh, sorry. Let's, let's do this. There's two cases, right, here? Let's suppose X is the positive one first, and then we'll come and do the negative one. If X is positive 6 over root 11, <coughs> then Y must be 1 third of that, right? Which is just 2 over root 11. And then Z must be negative 1 third times x, so negative 2 over root 11. That's from here. So I have an ordered triple, don't I? I, I have x, y, z. So here's what I've got so far. I know that, I know that uh, if x is 6 over root 11, then y must be 2 over root 11. And then z must be negative 2 over root 11. Right? That's my x, my y, my z. Something interesting is happening there. I don't know yet what is happening, but I know that that's an inter interesting point. You following me? Now I need to look at the other case. What if x was negative? The y would be negative, and the z would be positive. So all that would happen is this would change to negative 6 over root 11 negative 2 over root 11, and then 2 over root 11. And from, from the geometry of the problem, there should be two points that we're going to find here, right? One of them is furthest away, the other one is closest. <coughs> and we have two. Now before I stop and we get, we find out, you know, which of these corresponds to the maximum distance or closest and furthest, whatever, um, we did say suppose x, y, and z weren't zero, right? What if they were? What if x, y, and z were 0? Fourth equation, we Fourth equation wouldn't work, right? So if x, y, and z are all 0, then your fourth equation is not satisfied. So we can throw those out. Understand? Now you could write that down, you know, to be technically correct. Suppose x equals y equals z equals 0. If they're all 0, Equation 4 would say x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. That wouldn't be true, right? So we're done. I never found lambda, did I? Could you? Didn't we solve for lambda earlier? Didn't we solve for lambda earlier? Lambda was like, we solved for it three different times. It was. It was uh, x minus 3 over 2x root junk, right? Well, if you plug in x, y, z into here, you would find lambda. I'm going to pass on that, OK? Lambda here is something, but I know I could find it, right? And here, lambda is something. It could, it could be a different lambda for this, all right? I don't care. I care about x, y, z. All right, so let's do it. Let's try and figure out which one of these is furthest, which one of these is closest. <clears throat> that might be a little tough. So my function 
f, I'm going to plug in, let me plug in the 6 over root 11, uh, 2 over root 11, negative 2 over root 11, and I'm plugging that into the square root of x minus 3, 6 over root 11, minus 3 squared. Do you understand where I'm putting this? 2 over root 11 minus 1 squared, negative 2 over root 11 plus 1 squared. And then I have to figure out what that is, right? And I'm going to cheat because I don't feel like using my calculator. I believe I already had my computer do this. I uh, thought I did. This turns out to be about 1.316. Okay. And the other one, if you plug in negative, negative, positive, Okay, into this, the other one turns out to be 5 point something. So if you do F of, I'll stick with black, the green doesn't show up on camera very well. If I do F of negative 6 over root 11, negative 2 over root 11, 2 over root 11, you get approximately 5 point, I don't know. 5.31, 6. So this, this point right here, right? This point right here? Well, I should say this one. This one right here is closest, isn't it? And this one right here is furthest away. And both of these points live on your sphere. Got it? I can't think of another way you would do that problem without Lagrange multipliers at this point in this class. Like, that's all you've got. <clears throat> now, I, I do have a demonstration that shows you kind of like why Lagrange works, but because of time, I'm not really going to go into it. If you want to see it, you can come in my office and I can show it to you. It only works for, it, it's, a, it, it's a way to try and convince you that this works but it's only going to work for the two variable case, like f of x, y. Once you get past that, you just kind of have to, without get, you can't get into it visually at that point. OK, moving on. What did you all think of that one? All right? Sucked? Glad to be back? Yes, yes to all those? All the above. So I'm, I'm not doing quite a few problems here. Um, like I'm not doing these, these first two examples I was going to do in class, but I'm going to leave those for you. And there's problems in your homework that you'll get some more practice with this. The challenge again is going to be the solving of the equations. How are you going to go about doing that? There's no like always do it this way or, you know, you just got to play with it. <clears throat> How about this one? Maybe we can talk about this one without actually going through the whole thing. Maybe just set up what's the objective function, what's the constraint. <clears throat> Find the maximum volume of a rectangular box with no lid if it is to be made of 12 square meters of cardboard. Does this look familiar? This is a Cal 1 problem. This is a Cal 1 problem. You can do, it, do, this, you can do this with Cal 1. <clears throat> but it's easier, it's easier in Cal 3. It's much easier. Okay, so what are we trying to find the maximum of? Maximum what? Volume. What's the volume of a rectangular box? Length times width times height. So why don't I call it x, y, z? Is that okay with you? Does, it, does that make you happy that this is going to be a function of three variables? x, y, z, yeah? Okay. Constraint. All right, so let's talk about the constraint. <clears throat> this box has no lid. <clears throat> There's your box. It has no lid on it, right? So you can put your hand in there. But it has a bottom to it. 
We know the volume, if we call this x and call this y and call that z, we know the volume is x, y, z. But it has to be made from 12 square meters of cardboard. That means the total surface area of this has to be 12, right? That's a constraint, isn't it? That's a constraint. What's the surface area of this thing? So what's the surface area of this front face? XZ. How about that back right there? XZ. So I know that two XZs plus, how about this side right here? Y times Z, this side, Y times Z. I know that two of those plus the bottom Okay, what's the area of that bottom piece? Just one of them, x, y, because it didn't have a lid, right? That must be 12. Objective, constraint, you go to town now. Understand how that sets up? <clears throat> Actually, in uh, Cal 1, you couldn't do this problem. The way they present it in Cal 1 is they give you a sheet of paper and you like cut out corners does that look familiar? Maybe you didn't. You may or may not have seen it. It just depends on your instructor and whether or not you got to it. But that's different because you're cutting squares out of the edges, and that's a little bit of a different problem. So all right, let's look at another one. I'm not going to work through that one. Find the maximum uh, volume of a rectangular box with double bottom if it is to be made of 81 feet of cardboard with a double bottom. So it's the same picture, right? Except they're going to reinforce the bottom with two sheets of cardboard, which is the same as having a top to it, isn't it? Yeah. All that changes is this. And then this is what? 81? There you go. Same exact thing, right? Except change that to a 2. Or, uh, oh wait, it doesn't say it has a top. Does it say anything about the top? Double Just double bottom. So what do you all think? 3 or 2? I think three, don't you? They didn't say no lid, right? So we should assume lid? So it'd have a lid and a double bottom. So then that should be a three. Take that back. Thank you, Luke. But you get the idea, right? I mean, it's just a matter of interpreting the problem, converting it over to the, to the math now. We just did that one. OK. Now this, I don't have an example for, but I think I might do one. It just depends. I'm afraid to get into one because I'm afraid of how messy it might get. But let's say that you have a function of three variables, and you want to you want to um, constrain it, but give it two constraints instead of one. I'll give you an, an example um, just real quick, just thinking about it. Remember that sphere we just had, right? And we had a point, and we found the point, the two points that were closest and furthest away from that point. What if I came through, we know this has a constraint equation. It was x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4, right? That's what it was. What if I said, take a, um, take a cylinder and pass the cylinder through your sphere somewhere. It would cut through, wouldn't it? And it would create like a little path on top, like a little ellipse or something on top, or a circle on top, yes? And you would have another one on the bottom where it cut through. And now my question is, what points on the intersection of these two surfaces, on that little thing and on that, which points on those things are closest to this? Understand? So the way this works is that you have two constraints now. You have to live on the sphere, that's your first constraint, but you also must live on something else, which in this case would be a cylinder. And then Lagrange has an, a way you do that. The Lagrange method for this is that you set the gradient of f equal to, well this part is exactly the same, right? Lambda times gradient of g, but then you say plus another constant mu times the gradient of h. How many equations will you get from these right here? You get three from this, and then four, and then five. You'll have five equations. You're solving for x, y, z, lambda, and mu. Five equations, five, vari five, equations, five variables. Would you like to see one of these? OK, let's, let's pick one out of the book. 
and it, I, I think I'll do a word problem if I can find a good one. And I just hope it's not going to be too hard. Okay, yeah, this one looks okay. I'm going to do the example right out of the book. That way we're playing it safe. Okay, so what we have is we have a function. The function we're, give, we're given here is x, y, z is x plus 2y plus 3z. It says find the max of this, okay? Find the max of this function on the curve of intersection of the plane x minus y plus z equals 1. That's the equation of a plane, isn't it? Okay. And the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 1. Okay, so geometrically, if I can try this, what we have is a cylinder, okay, right there. And we have a plane. Is there any other? I thought I saw a bunch of other colors in here. Let's see red, try this. We have, a, we have a plane, right? And we're assuming that this plane comes through and cuts through this cylinder, right? And creates, well, that's terrible. Just say it cuts through somewhere, all right? And where it cuts through, it creates a curve, doesn't it? And there were problems that we had in the past where we, you were asked to find the vector equation of the curve, right? Intersection of two things, and you, you did that. What we're trying to figure out, though, is that if you take just the points that live on this intersection, these all have x, y, z's. You take each point and you plug them into that function, what's the biggest value you're going to get out? So your domain is actually just the points on this curve. You're constrained to that intersection, but you're plugging those into this function. What's the biggest thing that comes out? All right, so understand you have two constraints then? All right, let's write down, let's call this one G. The left side's G. This one is H, isn't it? And so let me write down my equations. The first one, I need the partial of f with respect to x to be equal to. Let's see if you can pick this up without me really giving you time to write any of that stuff down. That has to be equal to lambda, lambda partial g with respect to x plus mu partial h with respect to x. That's the first equation I'm going to have. Second equation. Partial f with respect to y plus, sorry, not plus. Partial of f with respect to y equals lambda partial g with respect to y plus mu partial h with respect to y. The third equation? Yes. Is lambda multiplied cross or is it? Nope, it's just lambda times the g. That's it. And this is just mu times the h. OK, third equation. <coughs> Partial of 
partial f with respect to z, lambda partial g with respect to z, plus mu partial h with respect to z. What's the fourth and fifth equation? The constraints, right? So I'll say that this one right here is 4, and this is 5. We OK with that? Or let's see. I'm hoping these are going to turn out to be nice. What is the partial of f with respect to x? One. Yes, 1. Lambda times, what's partial of g with respect to x? 1. So that's just lambda, isn't it? Plus, what's the partial of h with respect to x? 2, 2x and then times the mu. So it's going to be 2 mu x. Is that OK? Next one. Partial of f with respect to y. 2 equals lambda times partial of g with respect to y. Negative 1, so negative lambda. Plus, OK, mu partial of h with respect to y. 2u mu y. We good? Third one? Three. Lambda. lambda. Oh, we're so lucky right now. What's partial of this with respect to z? Zero. zero. Right? Plus mu times zero, but that means that's gone, which means lambda's three. And once I know lambda's three, I can come back over here, right? If lambda is 3, then this really becomes 3. Then move it over to the other side. This is negative 2 equals 2 mu x, which means negative 1 equals mu x. OK? If, if lambda is 3 here, you get, what, 5? So you get 5 equals 2 mu y. And then this one, we don't even care about that, right? Now what? Solve for what? OK, if you solve for mu, you're going to have to promise me something, though. You've got to promise me x and y aren't 0, right? That's OK, though, right? Because what? You'll never satisfy equation 5 if x and y are both 0. Yes? So I'm going to just pick up right here. Suppose x and y are both not 0. Then equation 1 tells us that mu, mu would be what? Negative 1 over x. And then equation 2 would tell us that mu is 5 over 2y. Now you can set those equal to each other, right? So you get negative 1 over x equals 5 over 2y. And do your little crisscrossy thing, however you want to do it. Negative 2y equals 5x. So we have a relationship between x and y, don't we? How about I solve this for y? y is negative 5 halves x. Are you all good? OK, what should I do with this? Take that to the fifth equation, right? Because if I have a relationship between x and y, this equation happens to have x and y in it, right? So I should be able to solve for x here. All right, so I'm going to go to equation 5, continuing here. In equation 5, I can rewrite that as x squared plus what's y squared for us if y is this? 25 fourths x squared must equal 1. So what is that? 29 fourths x squared is 1. x squared is 4 ninths. And so finally, why is that cursor get down there? Get up there. X would be plus or minus 
to route twenty over route twenty nine. All right, so I have to look at both of those cases now, don't I? So suppose x is positive 2 over root 29. What's y going to be then? It's right here, right? So what would happen if I do that? I do negative 5 halves times 2 over root 29. I just get negative 5 over root 29, right? What's that? Negative 10 over. Yeah, yeah, I reduced it. I reduced it. So I have x and y. Solve for z. Solve for z. Where? Fourth equation, right? If I know x and y, I can get z, can't I? So now I'm going to go to the fourth equation. Fourth equation. Um, is going to be 2 over root 29 minus y, but y is already negative, isn't it? So won't that be plus 5 over root 29 plus z equals 1, uh, root 29? So z looks like it's going to turn out to be 1 minus 7 over root 29. And you could get a common denominator and stuff, but I'm just going to leave it like that. That's z. So I found an x, y, z, didn't I? So it appears that 2 over root 29, negative 5 over root 29, and 1 minus 7 over root 29 is one place of interest, right? Now, I could go and try and find out what, what well, I know lambda is 3, right? I could go figure out what mu is, but I don't need it. And here's x, y, z right here. Now, I also need to look at what? Negative x, right? So how would that change things, right? We would have some different results. And then you take those answers and you plug them into the original function to figure out the maximum. Do you think you can handle it from there? Yeah? I did say suppose that um, x and y were both not 0. So if x and y were 0, equation 5 wouldn't work, you'd be done. That's example 5 on page 682 if you want to see what the final answer is for that. All right. The homework for this section is, I changed it, where is it? There it is. That has the correct page, and it has the, correct, the corrected numbers you should do. I did a couple of those on video. They're online. We good? Yes? I didn't see the I just put it up this morning. Yeah, I think I did numbers 1, 5, and 13. Let me see. 1, yeah, I think that's what I did. I will warn you, though, number 7 is a little, little tricky. The algebra of 7 is a little weird. Um, if you do wind up getting into some trouble on 7, I'll refer you back to... Well, maybe not. I'll uh, just see what happens on 7. I thought I had some work in here that might help. All right, that's it. We good? We can close the book on Chapter 11. And now we begin Chapter 12. We only have two more chapters. We're halfway there. We've done 10 and 11, right? 12 and 13, the book, we're done with the book.
Ouais, ça sound good? All right, so now we're actually going to do some integration. I know, you know, like, it's, it's going to start to look a lot more like Cal 2 for a while now, all right? Until we get to um, chapter 13, which will still be integration, but it will be a lot different, all right? So we'll be in vector, vector fields and things like that instead of, of this stuff, so. If you liked Cal 2 and integration, got good news. All right, so I put here in Cal 1, we learned that area under a curve is a Riemann sum. That might have happened in Cal 2. It might have never happened. I don't know. It depends on where, how you got here. But there's this thing in Cal 1 or 2 called the Riemann sum. And it was, it was the way that we found that the area under a curve was tied to the integral, the antiderivative. So do we all understand that you have a function from A to B? If you want to know the area, then you have to find the antiderivative of little f. So that that would be integral A to B of that function. Whatever the antiderivative is, you plug in B, get a number. Plug in A, get a number, subtract the two. Yes? It's Cal 2. Where this comes from, okay, the idea behind this is that this, why is my cursor, whoa, ah, shit, I hate Windows, man, does these stupid updates, can I stop it? Freaking Windows, man. I knew earlier, too, because it prompted me, and I told it to postpone. OK, well, while it's doing that, I can't even get that to be white screen now. You want to see the notes? No, no. I, I, yeah, I know. I want to show everyone that, though. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, OK, that's a good idea. How about that quiz, the mini exam that is supposed to be a presentation? Remember that thing? I turn, I hand you in the first day of class, first or second day. Nobody has brought it up until today, saying, "Hey, what about that thing?" You know. So um, here's what I'm thinking because I was hoping that you know throughout the entire semester, every week I'd have a student or two in there doing some problems. <laughs> Not the last like four weeks, everyone's trying to rush through it. So what I think I'll do is I'll, I'm going to offer it as a, not a bonus, but as a way to replace your lowest mini exam score. Okay? But that means then it's going to have to be a little bit amped up. It can't just be like the easiest problem. I'm going to give you a thumbs up or down on whether or not you can do that problem. So you, have to, you need to approach me. Um, I'll make it individual. You don't have to do it in group. If you do it in group, great. But individually, you have to approach me. And you have to um, say, hey, I would like to do this problem. You know, and present it to you. And you can show me your work. And I can say, yeah, it looks good. And it'll probably take a couple of meetings, maybe two or three meetings between us. And then you'd, you'd present that, OK? And I'd like to record it. So if you're up for that, then let me know. If you're not, then it's not, it will not hurt your grade if you don't do it. Questions? So it has to be a problem out of the book? No, no, it has to be a mini exam problem. Yep. All right, so while this is almost done here, the idea behind this area under a curve, the Riemann sum, how many of you saw Riemann sums? Like you saw it a little bit? Okay, some of you have not. The idea is that if you want to approximate the area under here, what you're going to do is you're going to imagine having a rectangle in here. And we can find the area of that rectangle. And if I get more rectangles in here and add them all up, then that would give me an approximation of the area. 
and it would be off a little bit because I'd always have a little bit of error in here, right? I'd always have a little bit, I'd always be a little bit off. But the more rectangles I had, the closer my answer would be to the correct answer. <clears throat> so the way we look at this is that the, the width of each of those we call delta x, that's the change in x. The height of this right here is just the function's value at x, and that's the area of one of these. And if I want to add them all up, it's the height times the width, right? That's the height of the rectangle times the width. And if I let there become an infinite number of these, right, an infinite number of rectangles, this symbol becomes an integral symbol, this stays the same, and this delta x becomes the differential dx, which is an infinitesimally small width. So that formula is directly related to this right here. Yes? That's all you need to know. I mean, we're not going to get into like hardcore Riemann sums by hand. I'm just trying to remind you of where that came from. All right, great. I thought it would give me another warning, you know, and be like, hey, would you like to? <laughs> Doesn't like that. so much crap running in the background it's taking forever for this thing to remember who it is maybe it's a sign we should call it a day it's too much for one day. All right, here we go. So we have the Riemann sums. So the total area, like I just said, okay, total area, you take a summation symbol, you basically let there be an infinite number of rectangles, and it becomes this integral symbol instead. Here's a picture of what I was just saying. And the more rectangles you have, the closer your estimated area gets to your true area. But that's Cal 1 slash 2. We're, we're talking about something else here, all right? This, but we're still looking back in Cal 1 right now. We we're about to look in Cal 2. Remember that in Cal 1, or Cal 2, when we were doing the integration, can I just say Cal 2? This is more Cal 2 than Cal 1, okay. The domain, right? That little dx, the little change in x, the width, came off the number line. It was, it was this piece right here, right? That's our dx down there. And so the domain was a number line. And so we were looking at the interval AB, weren't we? Looking at this interval just between here and here. What's the area? And what we did was we picked some point, any point, didn't matter where it was, any point inside that rectangle, plug that point into the function, that's what this says, hard to read it, f of x sub i. As long as you pick a point inside this interval and plug it in, that height will work. Because the more narrow your rectangle gets, that point basically converges down to one, it can only be one value. So that's, that's the idea from Cal2. We are interested now in looking at trying to find what are called double integrals and so instead of looking at the area underneath the curve, we want to look at the volume under a surface. But do you see the similarities in it? Okay, so we're going to try it using Riemann sums. So here is, here is a surface. No, there is no surface there. There is a surface right here. 
and I'm trying to find the volume underneath it, right? So what I do is I cut up a bunch of rectangular boxes, and I try and find the volume of each of these boxes. And if I could find a formula for the volume of each of those boxes, I would just add them up, wouldn't I? If I add them all up, I'd get an approximate volume. Do you all see the connection here? Now, if I do more, more little boxes, right, smaller and smaller little rectangular boxes in there, I'm going to start to get closer and closer to the true volume, right? And the way to actually get the true volume would be to let the number of those go to infinity. But that means turning a sum into an integral, right? So let's try and see if we can come up with a formula that would give us a volume of each, of, of like an individual box. And this is my, my best rendition of it. First of all, since we're looking, we're looking at the ground, right? This is a three-dimensional drawing. Here's the ground. Our ground is going to be a rectangle. All right, and we're just going to look above that rectangle up into the surface. So this is us looking straight down on that rectangle. If I pick some little dx, remember dx came off the x-axis? Some little dx, and I pick some little dy this way, I create this little box right here. If I pick some point inside that box, it would have both an x and a y coordinate. I'm going to call it x sub i, y sub i, and I plug that into the surface, it will pop up and it will be some value, and that will give me a height, won't it? And the volume of this is what? Length times width times height, right? So isn't it, this is the height, this is the width, and the height. I mean, sorry, length and width, right? So that's the volume of one of those little uh, guys, and I want to add it up forever. But the thing is, you have to do a double summation. And the reason you have to do a double sum is, let's say you fix your dx this way and then you start, moving, you start moving this way. So you take a sum in this direction, but you also have to take a sum in this direction. You have to move your x's over back and forth and your y's back and forth. So it becomes a double summation, right? It's the limit as you let the number of these rectangles, uh, rectangular boxes go to infinity of a double sum, which creates a double integral. And then this right here is this formula converted over. Do you all see that? And that's it. That's how you find the volume. It's, it's our formula. It's what we're going to use for the rest of this section. OK, so if you're trying to find the volume between some surface, f of x, y, and the x, y plane, which would be the ground, over some rectangular region. Now notice the way that we write the rectangular region. We write the closed interval AB cross CD. It's not a cross product, okay? That's just the way we write a rectangular region in R2. <clears throat> then it's given by this double integral. Now pay attention to this. Double integral over R. R is what? R is the rectangle, right? The double integral over R of f of x, y. This right here represented what part of the picture? The f of x, y was the, the height, right? So this was the height of it. This right here, D capital A. What do you think the capital A stands for? Area, area right? It's, it's an infinitesimal area on the ground. If I go back to that picture, this right here, that yellow piece right there is delta x times delta y. That's a little area on the ground, isn't it? <clears throat> so that is actually the dA. And now if I just change that over, this is, this is what dA is, right? dx times dy. Or it's this other formula. What's the difference between these two? Let's see. This one, let's look at this one. If we work from the inside out, the inner, integ the inner integral, which I mean right here, the limits of integration are C and D, aren't they? C and D are your Y values, aren't they? And I'm integrating with respect to Y. Then I have an outer integral, 
which takes this answer and integrates from A to B and with respect to X. And that's because X is, uh, corresponds to the AB, right, the X axis? I could, though, do it the other way around. I could change the order. I could go from A to B, do it with respect to X first, take that answer, go from C to D and do it with respect to Y. All right? Both of those are um, at your disposal to use. You get to pick which one. If you're integrating over a rectangle, and only if you're integrating over a rectangle. In the next section, we integrate over more complicated regions, and you can't just switch it up whenever you want. <coughs> so the rectangular region to integrate over is the easiest out of all the regions we're going to integrate on. So how do we integrate something like I just said? How would we do this integral on the inside? According to what I'm saying here in the notes, if you're going to take the antiderivative of a function of two variables with respect to y, you're going to treat x as a constant when you do your antiderivative. Just like when we did with partial derivatives, we're doing basically like a partial antiderivative now. We're going to hold one constant and go backwards. So the inner integral is this one in here. Since it's with respect to y, we hold x constant. <coughs> and then on the outer integral, once we get to the outer one, x will be your variable. This one, it's the other way around, right? We're going to integrate with respect to x first, then we're going to hold y as a constant. Once we've done that, then we integrate with respect to y. You just got to see these in action. I think it's time for an example. I had this problem earlier. Let's do the problem first, and then we'll take a look at it. Find the volume under this thing. on that rectangular region. So I'm, I'm going to draw a quick picture of the domain. My domain, what I'm integrating over, goes from 0 to 2 and 0 to 2. 0 to 2 on my x and y, right, or my x-axis, and then 0 to 2 on my y-axis. So this is A, this is B, this is C, this is D. So it's, it's actually a box, isn't it? That's, that's my region. I'm going to call this R for a rectangular region or a rectangle. <clears throat> so to do this correctly, I'm going to do a double integral over R of f of x, y, d, A. Okay, now it's my choice on which I want to integrate with respect to first. So I'm going to write double integral. Let's go ahead and write the function in here. 16 minus x squared minus y squared, uh, 2y squared, oops. Would you like to integrate with respect to x or y first? You want to do x? Okay, let's do x. And then we'll do y after that. So what I'd like to do is break this up. Everyone understand we have an inner integral. That's the one in red. Then we have an outer integral, which will be the one with respect to y. Now, we're going to do triple integrals in this class, too, where we're going to have like an inner and then like a middle and then an outer. Right now, we're just at a double integral. So when I say inner, I'm talking about the one on the inside, right? So let's take the antiderivative. Let's go ahead. Um, oh, wait, we forgot our limits of integration. What's the limits on here? Zero, we can't get it wrong because they're both 0, 2, right? But it's the x's, right? I'm pulling the x's, so I'm pulling these two. And then this one is also 0, 2, but that's the outer one because those goes with the y, right? All right, what is the antiderivative of this? And I'm going to leave this integral out here. I'm going to do my work on the inside. See, dy over here. 
What is the antiderivative of 16 with respect to x? 16x, right? 16x. What is the antiderivative of negative x squared with respect to x? 1 3rd x cubed. Everything seems pretty normal, right, so far? That's what we would expect from Cal 2. What's the antiderivative of negative 2y squared? Negative 2xy squared. Negative 2xy squared, or you could say y squared x. It doesn't matter. I'll go in alphabetical order. Uh, that OK? Yeah. Now, the reason why, everyone understand, if you were to take derivative of this with respect to x, you treat the negative 2y like a constant, then derivative of x is 1. So this would turn into negative 2y, which is here. So when you're going backwards from y, it, x is popping in here. That's all that's happening. Understand that? OK, that's the antiderivative. But we want to evaluate this where, where and where? 0, 2. Now we need to be a little more specific. What is it that I'm going to be replacing with 0 and 2? The x or the y? The x. So we're going to start writing down x is 0 and x is 2. And that's because we don't want to confuse ourselves, especially when we get to triple integrals. We're going to have x, y, and z, and you've got to keep track of which one you're plugging back in for. So the way I did it in Cal 2 is I took this number, I plugged it in. I subtract from that what I get when I plug in this number, right? So let's go ahead and do that. So this should be equal to, I still have an outer integral I have not touched. OK, let's do this. Plug in 2 for x, and we get 32, right? Take away, what, 8 thirds? And then plug 2 in here for x, right? Minus 4. Y squared, we good? Now minus, now plug in 0 for x. Nice. Everything's gone, right? Any questions? This is a lot cleaner than Lagrange multipliers. It's more straightforward than all that. All right. I think I can get rid of the red brackets. I think I can just go to my, my integral. It's the integral from 0 to 2. Uh, maybe get a common denominator there. What is that? 396 96 thirds minus 8 thirds, right? 88 thirds. that fair? Now you're just integrating with respect to y. So now, I mean, this truly is like a Cal 2 integral, except y instead of x, right? So antiderivative of this is 88 thirds y minus 4 thirds y cubed evaluated at those two points. So yeah, this is y equals. Yeah, I'll put it in here. Because we we're at the last variable anyway, but yeah, let's stick, let's keep reminding me to do that because I, I forget all time to do it. Plug in two. What do we get? Two, one, seventy-six thirds, is that right? One hundred seventy-six thirds minus uh, eight. Two-thirds. Is four four one forty-four thirds. That goes in, doesn't it? Forty-eight. Mm, hold on. Yeah, forty-eight. 
That's the volume. It's, it's a unitless volume because we don't know what any of this is measured in. All right, should we take a look at the picture just to get an idea? Any questions on it? Okay, so geometrically, here's what's happening. Here's the domain, right, that lives on the ground, right? That's our 0202. Here's, here's the actual surface itself, okay? There's the surface. I just, I just graphed some of it. That's not the whole thing. If we just take this, the edges of this and plug it in, this will give you some idea of, of where it's going to map to. So, man, this is all messed up. Can you all see that on top of that surface? So just those points getting plugged in, and then I'm going to take all this crap out of here. There's the thing we're looking at. Underneath that surface, straight down on top of that rectangle, take all this junk out of here. What is the volume of that shape right there? 48 cubic whatever. Okay? That's what it is. It's kind of cool, huh? Now. We went with respect to x first, didn't we? What would have happened if we went with respect to y first? We should get the same answer, all right? I won't do it, but you can check for yourself. How about this one? This is really almost the same exact sort of setup, isn't it? I'm going to draw the domain over here. This time it's not 0, 2, 0, 2, so it's a little more complicated. X and Y. X is between uh, 1 and 2, so that's 1, here's 2. And the Y value is between 0 and pi. That's R, right? So I want the double integral of the function of x and y with respect to area. So I'm double integrating over r. OK, it's, it's your call now. Let's replace that function in there. And now let's discuss this. I have options, don't I? You want to integrate with respect to y or with respect to x? We didn't do y last time. We did x last time, right? You want to do y this time? Why don't you want to do y this time? Yeah, look at this. Hold on. I mean, this, this time, it actually is worth it for us to think through what the integration is going to be. So let's talk about both possibilities. First, let's talk about if we were to do it this way. All right? Focus all your attention on this right here. Right there, which variable is going to be a constant in the red brackets? Which variable is a constant? X, OK? So x may as well be the number 1, right? It's a constant. Let's just act like it. If x was 1, then you had to integrate that right there. How would you integrate that? Integration by parts. That's what it would take, right? This would take integration by parts to do. What was the number? It was, I mean, sorry, what was it? It was x in there. So do you feel like doing integration by parts? Sure we do. But would it be easier the other way, right? Would this be easier to do it this way? Now you're treating y like a constant. And so who cares? That may as well not be there. 
The antiderivative of sine of xy, again, y is a constant. Antiderivative of sine x, I'd rather do that than integration by parts. How about you? So there is where we actually need to consider whether or not the integrand is easier one way or the other. So this is preferred, yes? All right, so let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to have the outer integral. Um, I didn't put my limits of integration. I need to do that. What's going to go on the inner integral? 1, 2, and outer 0 pi, right? So I have 0 pi here. Let's go ahead and see if we can't find the antiderivative. I'm nervous about what I'm going to get for answers here. What's the antiderivative of y sine xy with respect to x? Cosine negative cosine xy over y. That's it. That's it right there. Look, if you get hung up on this, here's what I recommend you do. Okay, if, if you actually are hung up on this, just replace y with a number, okay? 2 sine of 2x. Integrate that. So the 2 can come out, right? Dx in there, sorry. I, I just have to trust you in Cal 3 that you can integrate sine 2x. Antiderivative of sine of something is negative cosine, but then you have to scale out one half. That one half comes out and pops that two and it's gone. So this is it right here. And then what? One and two, right? That's it, like that. And x, right? This time we're going x. Let's proceed. Continuing there, this is going to turn into integral 0 to pi. All right. Plug in 2 for x. You get negative cosine of 2y, right? And then plug in 1 for x, and you get minus and then negative cosine of y dy. Do you all agree with me on that? This is just a plus, isn't it? Now you can integrate with respect to y. So what is the antiderivative of negative cosine 2y? Negative one half sine two y. You're gonna have to probably brush up a little bit on your integration. I know it's been a while. Here, sine y. From y is zero to pi. Okay, here we go. Let's plug in pi. 2 pi, sine of 2 pi is 0, that's gone, sine of pi, 0. So we get 0 minus, now plug in 0. 0 again, everything 0. All of that for nothing, right? The volume is 0. Okay. Maybe we should take a look at it. Are there any questions over the integration, though? What do you notice here on this one that's different than the last one? Part of the function is above. The surface is above. And part of the surface goes below the xy plane. So guess what? It's counting the part below as a negative volume. It's counting the part above as a positive volume. We saw this in Cal 1, I mean in Cal 2. We saw the same exact thing. If you had a polynomial function, 
or any function, let's take the sine function. If you were in Cal 1 and you integrated the sine function from 0 to 2 pi, your answer is 0. You can check it yourself. And it's because back then it counted that as positive area and it counted this down here as negative area and they wiped each other out. So the way that you could get around that is you could figure out where it hits the x-axis, couldn't you? And just integrate from here to here and then you could like double the answer, couldn't you? Is that going to be easy for us to do here though? No. Because we would actually have to figure out where this surface hits the xy plane. So we would actually have to solve, what was it, y sine xy? We'd have to set that equal to 0. And we'd have to have all, find all solutions that live in that domain. And it's going to be a curve. And that, that we're not even going to touch that. We're not even going to mess with that. Right? But I'm just showing you that it inherently has some more difficulties than you do back in Cal 1, or Cal 2. God, I keep on saying Cal 2. Cal 1. All right. Fubini. Fubini's theorem. So, Remember I said we had some choices on the order of integration? This theorem verifies that. But there is some stuff that we need. Your function must be continuous, which means that your surface must behave pretty well. As long as it's continuous over the rectangle, <coughs> the order of integration doesn't matter. On a rectangle, it doesn't matter. Verify. I don't think I'll verify this. What, I, what you can do on your own, though, is just try this. Try setting this up both ways. Right? Set it up both ways. Uh, this one, what, what would be the limits on the outer one here? 1, 2, and here, 0, 1. This one went the other way around. You could do this on your own, show that those are equal. You, you'll get the same answer both ways. And it's because this function is well behaved. xy squared is a nice continuous function. The order of integration shouldn't make that much of a difference in the antiderivative here, should it? No? Seems like both ways would be OK. Now we do have a special, special case. If the function of two variables that you're looking at can be rewritten as the product of two distinct functions, one of them being a function of x, the other one being a function of y, then you can do something you've never been able to do before. And that's split a product inside of an integral into a product of two separate integrals. You've never been able to do this, ever. You can only do it if the function of two variables can be split up into two functions. You'll see, let me show you an example of how this, how this would work. Right here, this one. So find the volume under sine x cosine y on the following rectangular region. So when you look at this, can you see right here, this is a function of x, and this right here is a function of y, and they are separated by multiplication. They are distinct. They are, they are separated. Yes? Compare that to the one we did earlier. We did a double integral as uh, this one, right? This one wouldn't work, would it? Because this sine function has x times y inside of it. I would need this just to be x. Then I could split it into two, because that would be a function of y. This would be a function of x. So this would not fall into the special case. 
but that one does. So here's what I can do. I can take this double integral over the rectangular region of this function with respect to its area, and I can rewrite it as two integrals, one with respect to x, one with respect to y, and I can multiply the two answers. Now the one with respect to x is just sine x, and what are my limits of inter uh, integration on x? 0 to pi over 2. And over here is the distinct function of y, which was cosine y. And my restrictions here are 0 to pi over 2. That's only because these were separated, right? So we could write a function like that, say, uh, we could factor it to the point mm -hmm. that it looks like we could separate it. That's also yes. Yes. Now, I'll be honest with you. We don't use this much. But when it does creep its little head out, you want to pop and get on it as soon as you can. Because it saves you time and energy if you can do that. Right? Because these two are pretty, pretty clear, pretty clean. OK. All right, so should I keep going or no? You can do that? You can do that? OK. Dot, dot, dot. All right, a couple of properties of double integrals. These are going to seem very similar to things you saw with regular integrals back in Cal 2. If you have the sum or difference, sum or difference of two different functions of x and y, you can split it up into two different double integrals, as long as it's plus or minus. If you have a constant in front of a function of two variables, you can pull the constant out. That we have did before. If you have a function that's bigger than or equal to another function, for all x's and y's in the rectangular region, then the volume under this one should be greater or equal to the volume under this one. So that's just saying if I have a surface that's above another surface, then the volume under this one has to be bigger than or equal to the volume under this one. Now let's see if you can recall this again from Cal 2. When you first went to Cal 2, they said, hey, here's the area underneath some function f, right? They said, hey, the integral, and there's the area. Then after that, they said, well, what if you had another function, g, and you wanted to find the, the area between them? Then you just subtract, right? You take the area under f, you subtract the area under g. So back in Cal 1, this turned into a, b, f minus g dx, right? That would represent the area in between. We have the exact same thing for the volume between two surfaces. If you're, trying to, if you're given two surfaces, f of x, y, and g of x, y, on some rectangular region, then the volume between them is the difference between the functions. But because of properties of inter double integrals, I can split it into two separate ones, right? So it's just here's the volume under f, subtract the volume under g, that'll be the difference in the volumes. Now this is assuming here that f was bigger than g. If g was bigger than f, then you would get a negative volume as an answer. Here's the picture of that. I think this is a pretty good picture. You've got the domain on the ground. You've got surface g, which is below surface f. And so you're trying to find the volume between those two. All right. We actually covered a little more ground than I thought we were. There's the homework. That's it for 12.1. Rectangular regions are, are the cleanest, easiest things you can do with, with double integrals. So where we're headed now is, OK, what if you don't have a rectangle? I'm leading into next class. What if instead of having a nice, pretty rectangle here, I say, all right, 
Um, still keep your x's between these two constants, so it's almost like a rectangle here. But on, the, on this way, on the y's, how about you just like fix it between two functions? So now you're looking, you're looking, it's almost like a half rectangle, like this is fixed, a and b, right? Your x is between two constants, but your y values are no longer between two constants, right? They vary. So this is a function of x, isn't it? This is a function of x. This is what we're going to refer to next class as a type 1 region. Your x's are between two constants, right? But your y's are between what? two functions of x. So some function of x here and some function of x here. So this will be like f and this will be g. How do you think that changes your double integral? Uh, we, well, instead of plugging your constants, you plug in yeah, see what's going to change here is you, you can no longer dictate the order of integration. You can't just swap around. Here you're forced <coughs> to do your x's last because they're constants. So you have to do a, b, dx on the outside, which means dy goes here. And then guess what? Your limits of integration are not numbers anymore. They are actual functions. So you're going to have g of x here. And f, I think we're going to use g and h, not, not f. So whatever this is here, you're going to find the antiderivative with respect to y, whatever that is. But instead of letting y be 2 and y be whatever, you're going to let y be whatever that is. And let y be whatever, and plug it in and subtract. So you're going to be plugging in functions instead of constants. It's just going to get nastier, but it's not necessarily any more difficult. And then what we do is we just rotate this around, and we do it the other way. C, D, and we have a type 2 region, which now your y's are between two constants, right? And your x's are between two fun functions of y. And so this changes c to d, functions of y, d switch. But that's all next class, all right? And after that, what do we do? Luckily, there will only be those two types. Then what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to change. We're going to have to change. Look, I still have th three minutes. Hold on. <laughs> so what, what's going to happen? After, I'm trying to lead you into where we're headed, OK? So you just get the big picture. What we're going to do is we're going to say, well, what if you have a region that looks like this? I mean, that seems like a natural region to want to integrate over. Circle or something like that. See, that's not a type 1 or type 2. Because you, <coughs> you can't fix your x's between two constants and your y between two functions because the top part of a circle and the bottom of a circle are not a function. So what we're going to do in order to attack this, we're going to have to change our whole perception of coordinate systems. So what we're going to do is go to polar coordinates to do this. We're going to get out of Cartesian coordinates and go to polar coordinates. If you've never seen polar coordinates, it's, it's OK, because I'll treat it like you've never seen it. But it'll be a quick, hey, these are polar coordinates, now let's get moving. All right? So we do polar coordinates. And then we pretty much can handle almost every type of region. Not, not all of them, but that takes care of a lot. Then from there, we go to triple integrals. So for triple integrals, your domain now lives where? Because for a double integral, the domain was in two-dimensional space. For a triple integral, your domain is actually three-dimensional space. So we start with the easiest three-dimensional solid you can think of, a box. So you know how we integrated over a rectangle to start here? When we get to triple integrals, the first one we'll do <coughs> is integrate over a rectangular cube looking thing. And then you start doing something like that in three-dimensional space. It gets very complicated because you can actually have like six types, type one, two, three, four, five, six. There's a bunch of different types. So. And then we realize, you know what, that Cartesian's not good enough. So we use spherical coordinates and cylindrical coordinates to do those. So we're going to, by the end of like the next few weeks, we will have introduced ourselves to polar coordinates, which is a way of representing two-dimensional space, alternative to Cartesian. We will go to cylindrical and spherical coordinates. So we're going to have at least three new coordinate systems that we're going to be working with in here. 
All right. Now I'm out of time. Y'all have a good day. Yes. I think the mini exam five is due next class. Yeah, Wednesday. Yeah, you should be able to do everything on it. I thought for sure that's what you did.